In this episode, I catch up with my friend Jack McClure, who I know through the ERE forums. He's been living in Alaska for the past decade and is the clearest example I know of someone who had an idea for what they wanted their life to be like and then pursued it with a relentlessness and a courage that is exceptional. We talk about his path to Alaska, his journey of skill development, which you know is near and dear to my heart. We talk about food, fitness, financials, family, strategy versus identity, and tons more. Honestly, I was pretty overwhelmed at the scope of trying to tackle Jack's story. Um, So I I hope to have him back on sometime in the near future, and we can dig in even further. You can find Jack on the internet at animaltrex.wordpress.com, and I've linked to his stuff in the show notes. Also, if you just Google Jack McClure, Alaska, he's the first hit. That's M-C-C-L-U-R-E. I'm Tyler Disney, and this is Advanced Retro Adaptics. For the uh, benefit of the audience, I just want to give like a micro introduction of like the last 10 years of your life, and then we can kind of dig into it. So you grew up near Chicago. You went to university for a degree in finance. Shortly after university, you moved to Alaska. That was about 2015. You had a guy job, and you were in the Arctic. You lived in the Arctic for two or so years. Uh, before you moved a little bit south, closer to town and other human beings. Um, you bought some land in 2020, built a cabin, got a girlfriend who's now your wife, and you just had a kid. Uh, you have a garden, you hunt, you fish, you ride your fat fat bike around in the snow, you do adventure races, you have a pilot's license. So as far as I can tell, you're just totally killing it at creating a really high quality Alaskan lifestyle, like on your own terms, <laughs> and you're about to turn tw- thirty in a couple of weeks. The, the first question I want to ask is why, why, why Alaska? Like you grew up near Chicago, what made you want to head to Alaska specifically? Yeah, so I guess I I didn't really have any conception of Alaska prior to the winter of 2012. You know, we Alaska, you think of its big wilderness outdoor place, and my family did nothing related to that we did day hikes occasionally on vacation but otherwise we were a suburban family and my version of going outside was uh, going to the golf course and in the winter of 2012 um, I've always read a lot and I came across a few books that winter that really changed the course of I guess the past nine years Um, two of those I think you've talked about on here and might be familiar to the audience uh, your money your life and early retirement extreme and then two others, um, One Man's Wilderness, and then subsequently more readings from One Man's Wilderness about the life of Dick Prenicke. And for those who aren't familiar, Dick Prenicke was a guy who lived in Alaska and in the year 1967, at the year, age of 50, uh, went out to a remote lake more than 50 miles from the nearest town and set out to build a log cabin using explicitly or solely hand tools that he had brought in and some that he fashioned himself and he did that it's a masterpiece you can go look it up there's documentaries as well you can search alone in the wilderness on youtube Um, and he lived there on and off and on for 30 years um, basically living uh, in the wilderness and he would get groceries delivered every few weeks or so but he he lived in the wilderness and watched the animals and traveled the country and reading that in suburban Chicago, I was like, wow, that, that is awesome. That's living. I want to do that. So, of course, the first thing I do as uh, I guess I was probably 19 at the time, I go and tell my mom. And she's like, yeah, that's cool. But you have literally none of those skills whatsoever. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so <laughs> that was like filed back in my brain. And um, it carried on for like a couple weeks, not thinking anything of it. And somehow I stumbled onto across an article on National Geographic's website, they had some article that was like 50 adventures for 50 states. And so each each day had its own adventure and looking at Alaska, they had one that said, do a null semester. And so I was like, what's null semester? I click on it and they talk about Knowles is the National Outdoor Leadership School. Um, basically they teach all kinds of leadership courses uh, ranging from two weeks to a whole summer, three months long, which was is their semester course in wilderness environments. 
and I went on their site, looked at the looked at the course, and I was like, oh wow, that's that's really cool. This can get me kind of get me there to to where I want to be. Um, and I ended up applying um, and doing that. I was supposed to go and travel travel abroad or study abroad, I guess, during school. And that time, I ended up canceling that and going then the following summer in 2013. And that's what introduced me to Alaska. Um, we were with 10 other students and three instructors. We were outside um, living in Alaska wilderness, more or less for 75 days, uh, 25 of that sea kayaking and the remainder 50 days we spent in uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park, the largest national park in the United States, backpacking and glacial mountaineering. And during that whole time, we didn't cross any roads. We weren't on any trails. We didn't pass through any towns. The only people we saw outside of our group was the pilot who resupplied us every eight days or so. And so that was a pretty transformative, transformative experience. And from that, that kind of got me hooked on Alaska. And there was really no turning back. Before we get further into Alaska, I'm, I'm wondering, like, before you read these books, did you have any sense that you wanted to do something out there? Like, like before you read the four books you mentioned, how did you think, if you even remember, how did you think about your future? Like, like, like were you looking for something adventurous, something crazy to do, or, or, or did that just, like, kind of come out of left field for you? Right. I, I think I was looking for something different. Um, I, no, I was looking for something different. I wish I know, I wish I knew the exact set of books that led me to the Prennecke journals. I, I don't know that. Um, with regards to Your Money, Your Life or Early Retirement Extreme, I was looking for alternative avenues. I, I was kind of not really set on going to college. Uh, it was just kind of a thing to do. And my parents definitely encouraged it. And their background, they both work, you know, corporate jobs. One's an accountant, one works has worked in finance and there's no alternative style work, no seasonal work or, or anything like that. So that really wasn't an option to me. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. And so I wanted to do something different. I wasn't really excited about the idea of going into corporate work, but I had no idea whatsoever of the options that were out there. Um, and so I remember reading other books like I think there's one that work less, live more. It talks about kind of the semi-retirement style. Uh, it's an older guide. And then from that, you know, I think that's how I got into your money, your life, and eventually early retirement extreme. But um, I, I don't remember how I got into the, the journals of, of Dick Prennecke, but that was a fortuitous, <laughs> fortuitous book to stumble upon. <laughs> yeah. Prennecke went out there when he was 50. Do you, do you know what he did before that? Like what was his life before he went to Alaska? Yeah, he had a really interesting life. Um, so he grew up in Iowa, and then he was in the military for World War II, I think either the Coast Guard or the Navy. I don't remember exactly. But um, he was stationed on Kodiak Island, which I guess they have a Coast Guard base there, so it could be the Coast Guard. Anyways, he was stationed on Kodiak Island um, in southern Alaska and lived there for quite a few years. Um, and he was a machinist and a diesel mechanic. And so he, he worked, he was known to be pretty good with handy with engines and, and things like that. But, um, kind of interestingly, like John Muir, you know, John Muir had the accident, which prompted him to want to go off and explore the woods. Uh, Dick Prennecke had an accident when he was working, um, in some capacity on an engine where he almost lost his eyesight. And so he was like, okay, well, it's not worth, um, uh, working anymore when there's this whole wilderness and and he wanted to go see you know basically his whole thing was to go test himself outside in the wilds of alaska um kind of like thoreau and and see how how he could do relying upon himself and so he spent a year going around the whole state or and various different areas and trying to find what the perfect spot was for him um and yeah he ended up settling on twin lakes what's now lake clark national park and yeah i guess we know the rest in there yeah I because I was thinking about how you started your journey so young comparatively to so many others. I mean, like your mom told you when you were 19, right. you didn't, by the time you were 20, you didn't have any skills, but since you were 20, you've been working on it. And to a lot of other people's perspectives, I'm jealous of your early start <laughs> of, of what seems to be. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, with, with Dick Brennecke too, one thing he wrote about in his books is that after he first, that book first got published, it was published by one of his friends. He'd get a ton of fan mail out to his place in, um, in Twin Lakes. They'd, they'd bring in mail when he gets groceries. And so he'd, he'd spend time answering all these different fan letters. And one thing that he said, um, in his journals is that he'd often get things from people in their early 20s saying they want to do the same thing they want to come out how do they do it and he would tell them you know wait until you're 50 basically wait until you're later in life because the at least in his time he thought the land would still be there and you could always go back but there's so much more beyond the wilderness that you can experience especially as a young person and i don't know i don't know if you appreciate it more later on or not um, I don't regret getting started on it early, um, but, uh, yeah, I guess it's a alternative perspective. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Him saying that had to have been going through your mind in the early days for me, because from my reading your journals, yeah, I don't remember reading you talking about ever doubting being in Alaska, but it was lonely, particularly in the first few years. Like it was hard. Being, yeah. Uh, particularly being so young, being in your early twenties, being in your mid twenties up there, not having, yeah, I mean, you lived in a town of like 11 people for a while. How did, <laughs> I don't even know what that, how was that? And how did you think about that in terms of, did it seem obvious that what you were doing was worth it, even though it was so hard? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, it kind of, I was like the frog in a boiling pot of water. I didn't know what I was getting into until <laughs> I, I already had like full blown loneliness. But, you know, I, I went up there and I was working as a guide out of a, a truck stop. And uh, it kind of, there's this area, Coldfoot, which is a little bit south of the town of, of Wiseman, which is where I eventually ended up living. And Coldfoot's just a truck stop that was built for, um, in the 70s for uh, the truckers going up to the oil fields on the North Slope of Alaska. And now it's pretty much the same thing, but it's also kind of a, has a tourism component where people fly up from Fairbanks or people doing cruises and all that. And so there's seasonal workers there and there's young people going in and out. So that's where I was for about the first um, year and a half when I was there in the Arctic. And then I wanted always to, you know, live more of the subsistence style lifestyle, living off the land. And that's kind of what the people in the community of Wiseman further up the valley um, were doing or and do um hunting for their food cutting firewood um some trapping in the winter and generally working to live rather than living to work and being there because they want to be on the land um not tied to a particular job or anything and so then i yeah i, mo I moved there and i start doing stuff and um yeah the there's just a the general demographics of that area i was the first person to move there in 11 years uh, most of the people there all of them were in their 50s or older uh, there is actually one 17 year old and then a three-year-old at the time but otherwise you know most of the people had already done things so there there weren't really people going out and hiking or, or doing things like that um, and so I was left to kind of do it on my own which was fine for the most part but um, yeah after a while um, it, it, it just got to be where I, I was basically spending a lot of time by myself. Like the average week I'd go, there'd probably be two days a week where I'd see people. And over the whole course of the week, I'd average, you know, an hour and a half or so of social time. There'd be a mail day uh, where everybody goes to this guy's house to get your mail because there's no post office there. <laughs> it was brought up from the, from cold foot. Um, so you go drink coffee, have all that, um, socialize and then on sunday i'd go to they had a little chapel and people went and sing songs and i'd go to that and um, have some cookies or whatever after but outside of that you know there wasn't much socialization and yeah that eventually got pretty hard um and i think your original question was did it seem obvious to me um well and yeah sure yeah yeah i guess i guess it became obvious later on that that it was getting pretty lonely, but I was kind of stuck in, I guess I was stuck in a mentality that um, I had this image of myself and I was trying to uphold it. And it became really hard to break out of the image, even though my mental health was degrading as a result of it. Um, 
I thought that, you know, I, I wanted to be like Dick Brennicky. I wanted to do what he did. And to do that, I had to live in that cabin by myself um, the way I was doing it, which is ridiculous now. But, you know, <laughs> as, as a person who didn't know very much then and still <laughs> to a great extent, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a hard lesson to learn. Did you change at all as a person? Like, did the experience of being lonely change you at all beyond having the realization that you're a person who needs more than an hour and a half of social time a week like did did that did, did it make you tougher did it make you more vulnerable like did that crack anything open in you like i know there's a lot of other stuff going on in that period of life but i'm just wondering if you can say like oh yes because of that that social period in my life i'm now different in such and such a way yeah i guess I'm not sure about psychologically. It, it really did kind of break me um, for a little bit. For It took probably, I don't know, after I moved down to Fairbanks, uh, probably a year or so until I felt comfortable again mentally. Um, I, I just stayed too long, uh, and it was just it was too much isolation for me. But um, I guess in other capacities, um, I would say, you know, I, I just lived so simply there. I, I had a little solar panel and I got my water originally from the river. Then I put in, um, a well and I got it from that. And otherwise, you know, I, I would get food from, from town every once in a while, but otherwise, you know, I'm just, I was just reading books. I wasn't working. I was occasionally helping out, uh, some grad students in the area. They were capturing lynx and snowshoe hares and chasing around other animals. So I did that <laughs> and it was kind of a carefree lifestyle. Um, not very sustainable. Um, <laughs> but it was, <laughs> it was kind of uh, interesting and in basically showing that, you know, I didn't need much to live. It, it was a very small cabin, 12 by 12. And, you know, it was dark there in the winter for, uh, I think it's 43 days straight or something like that, uh, where the sun doesn't rise above the horizon. <laughs> so it's like a form of, you know, there's the hedonic treadmill and then it's like a form of, uh, it's not the aesthetic treadmill as I don't really want to stay at that level but it's like aesthetic adaptation or some extent like that whereas like you know you get to a house and it's it's bigger than 12 by 12 it's like wow wow this is awesome you get to you get to spread out or you don't have to haul your water from a river it's like oh man that's really nice um so yeah I guess in that sense I don't know it I don't know I I I, for a while, I tried to avoid it, so I don't know if I, I did, I've done enough reflection on it to to really realize what what changed in me. Um, yeah, I only really went back there. I went back there after moving there, after leaving about six months later, and I went with some friends, and I was like, oh yeah, this is great. I could I could live here. Why did I leave? And then my friends left, and I was there by myself. I was like, oh man, <laughs> I remember why I left. Uh, um, and then, yeah, Alana and I went back with one of my sisters. Uh, Alana's my wife. Um, we went back with one of my sisters uh, a couple of years ago. And, yeah, it was a much different experience. You're in the Arctic, and then you left the Arctic. You had some work while you were up there, uh, guide work and such. What was your – how did you make this work financially? Like, what was – I mean, over the net, last nine years or so, can you sketch out kind of how you put together work? Because you haven't had a traditional career. I didn't get the sense. Um, and so, yeah, but how, how do you, how do you fund your lifestyle and how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, I guess I, you know, I started working, I was working as the guide job and that was, was pretty consistent. It was working most of the year. Um, most in the summer, you know, five days a week, sometimes six, um, and with some long days, but in the winter, not as much. And, you know, that was essentially more or less minimum wage, $11, $12 an hour plus tips. You get housing and food covered. So my expenses during that time when I was living there were extremely low. I was spending like under $100 a month and because, you know, there's no stores there. Even the nearest <laughs> grocery store or anything else is 250 miles away. Oh, my God. And other people, <laughs> I've, I've never really, I guess over this whole period since college, I've never really been a big drinker. Um, I've, I've never really, I don't do drugs really or anything. And so other people would party. They'd, they'd basically, you know, go down to Fairbanks and, go to the bars and get alcohol, whatever. And I would, I was content just to hang out there and read books or um, go hiking. And so I was able to save a lot of money that way. Um, I paid off 
I had some student loans. I paid off the private student loans I had. And then I was able to save enough to get myself set up for the winter in Wiseman, getting um, a whole solar set up, batteries, inverter, all that, getting food and everything. And then once I moved there, um, I wasn't really working. Um, I started writing. Or I guess I started writing after Knowles. Um, but I started writing for publications um, or submitting work to publications. And I got some things published in the Alaska newspaper and Alaska magazine. Um, and those paid quite a bit of money with pictures. Some paid like, I think the, the highest paying one was $1,500, which was quite a lot at the time for me because, you know, I didn't have any other expenses. Um, and then I was helping out the graduate students. I get a few hundred dollars there here and there or anything but ultimately you know like i said i was basically burning money and that was part basically the thing that drove me down to to fairbanks um besides loneliness is that i needed to to make money and so i was in fairbanks i worked a tour job there um for that winter and through some friends i met there i eventually learned about this uh forestry gig uh, working for the state, going around, flying around in a um, helicopter, basically doing forced inventory across the whole state. They're mapping and trying to figure things out, uh, what's where. And so they ended up hiring me, um, and I did that for the next three summers. Um, and that was great. Kind of similar deal to the tour guide in that, you know, you basically get your housing covered when you're with them, um, but you'd be traveling outside of town while you're on work and kind of uh, a different work schedule. Um, I think it was around 10 days on or 10 to 10, 10 to two weeks, 10 days on to two weeks long. Um, <laughs> it's a tongue twister, but uh, roughly two weeks on and you get like a week off. And so um, you get per diem for food and that, and it's, you know, ridiculous government amounts, something like $30 per day uh, for, <laughs> for food. So uh, you end up being able to save quite a bit. Um, and yeah, so then I guess going from there, I'd always wanted to, um, since, since I did Knowles, I wanted to get my pri pilot's license and that cost quite a bit of money. Um, and I definitely didn't have that much after my first year of forestry, um, after getting back on decent financial footing. And I went and worked at a gold mine, um, for three months. And that was to that point basically the most lucrative job I ever worked basically because all you do is work. Um, that was two weeks on 12 hour days and you know, you get more overtime than regular time. Um, but yeah, I did gold mine back to forestry and eventually picked up, um, this insurance job, um, through family contact, which I'm doing now, which eventually started as, um, doing some underwriting work for them and developed into doing, um, production and financial reports. Um, and that's all remote. And pays pretty decently and uh, I guess that's what I've been what I've been doing now since uh, full time I guess since I stopped doing forestry the end of 2020 yeah so um your, your background your your degree in finance I'm assuming gave you the the skills to uh or the background to do the insurance job right yeah so I ended up actually um I didn't end up actually finishing the major in finance uh I took the oh intro to finance course and i was like yeah this is not going to work out for me okay. and uh transition to um i was still in the business school but ended up studying entrepreneurship um inter interdisciplinary uh -huh. business studies with a focus on entrepreneurship um but it yeah it, it kind of gave me the baseline uh in terms of uh you had to take excel courses and i guess that's you know the majority of, of what i'm doing with my work sure Obviously, you know, Erie and your money or life, that's a, one way to look, view it as personal finance. It's a lot more than that, but also it involves that. Did your degree help you with that, prep you with that? Did, was there an integration between that or? Yeah, with, I don't know as much with the personal side of things with regards to finance, maybe with investments, um, because you're looking at, you know, balance sheets and different assets asset classes and how businesses are structured and, and things like that and being able to kind of figure out what's a good business. Um, and, you know, just and not necessarily related to like personal finance. I guess it is related to personal finance, but like basically being able to, I guess it's referred to as hustle and, you know, just like make money. Um, 
Whereas I had one class where the project was, you just had to create a business. You were given a partner and you had to create a business. It could be anything. And whoever made the most money by the following weekend won. And so my partner and I, um, we went to school, I went to school at Miami university in Ohio and this spot, um, there's a spot to go into town where all the bars are. Basically everybody has to funnel through this one spot on campus and there'd often be charities and things that go up there and sell things at night. And we decided to go there and sell hot dogs and bottles of water. And so we ended up selling uh, like $190 worth of hot dogs and water within like two hours. And we won <laughs> about like a <laughs> hundred bucks. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things like that were fun. Um, I, had a, I had a business selling uh, Hawaiian shaved ice out of a storefront in the summer of 2012 um, with different I had 11 employees, and that wasn't as successful, but um, was able to learn things from that. So I guess I guess being able to, yeah, yeah, I guess being able to, to know in, like, uh, different ways to make money, essentially, not that you necessarily have to get a job in, in order to fund your lifestyle. Yeah, that makes sense, because, like, when I graduated, the idea that you could do anything besides just get a full-time salary position just like completely not on my radar never even crossed my mind i was kind of in a similar boat because you know i got back from the Knowles course and i had one year of school left and i i at that point knew i wanted to do something different but still i had no idea outside of like becoming a Knowles instructor which wasn't going to happen with you know only taking one Knowles course and so i went to the career counselor and i was like yeah i want to do something different um and he's like okay what do you like and i'm like oh yeah outdoor stuff and he's like okay you could work at like rei patagonia or whatever but he's he's saying you know in like corporate departments i'm like no no you're missing the point <laughs> 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 oh man yeah that wasn't fruitful <laughs> a lot of people that you and i know there's there's kind of this choice between going uh, pursuing financial independence early right this whole fire model um and another model is we call it semi-eerie but it's like uh, don't worry about get it becoming financially independent so soon you can put things together make a little bit of money uh, and, and kind of get through and uh, sort of live life you want now you, your life seems pretty semi-eerie do you think about are you in pursuit of fi do you think about it much like what's your perspective on that um on terms of like crossing the line of not having to work anymore if you don't want to yeah i i kind of go back and forth on it for a while i was i was definitely um trying to pursue fi uh, financial independence um but you know kind of following the discussions and thinking things over myself on and basically it's it's your question that i really like like what do you do on a tuesday <laughs> on a random tuesday and you know you can have all the money in the world and if you have all the time and you have no idea what to do, you're still going to be miserable. Um, that that's, there's basically two things that came out of the Arctic. Um, realizing was one that I needed some type of community. Um, and just at least it, it didn't have to be that great, but I just needed some type of community and I needed something to do. Um, I didn't really feel like I was using my time productively there. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, at a, at a certain point, if you make money and spend too little, FI is just going to happen regardless. And that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I guess I'm not intentionally pursuing it, but if I stay on the current course, I think we'll be at, I'll be at like 4% sometime at the end of next year. Um, and then, but yeah, I mean, as, as a, then now I have a family, I have a wife and daughter. And so, you know, it gets a little bit more complicated, but even so, Alana, she's my wife. She's frugal, and um, she has some savings of her own. So, um, it's not. It wouldn't be beyond a, a couple, two to three years or so before we could get there collectively as a family, as things stand now. But, you know, I like. I I feel like I I generally do the things I want to do now. Um, work, for the most part, isn't a hindrance. Um, and so it's, it. There's not much that would really change. Uh, it might change in terms of like pursuing more things that that take more time um that i want to do or that we want to do uh whether it's going on long hikes going on long floats um or just 
doing other things, whether that's jobs or, or starting businesses. Like I really got into making pizza. I made a lot of pizzas this year. Um, <laughs> and I want, I want to sell pizzas out of a, a small hut or something. And, you know, if I, I, I don't necessarily have to make money out of doing that. I, I just really like making pizzas right now. And, um, I think it'd be fun to, you know, there, there's a tamale lady in Fairbanks. She just makes them until she sells out and doing something like that with Fairbanks with uh, pizza would be a lot of fun. You know, I got the sense that you're really good at studying. <laughs> you're really good at studying and you're really good at picking up skills. Like you had, you had, you mentioned a couple of times, like, ah, I forget if it was the, the pilot training or something else you're doing. Like the instructors are like, wow, you picked this up really quick. You're doing a really good job. Uh, first of all, do you think that's accurate? And what, what do you attribute that to? If so? Yeah, I, I, I do think it's accurate. Um, it happened in, in my forestry work and I, when I was working at the gold mine and some other stuff, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't do anything. I guess I, I don't know. I, I, part of it is just showing up. I think a lot of people don't show up and, and basically, you know, that when they're, you're told what you can do to, to get something done, um, and you follow it, it generally works. <laughs> and I guess in, in stuff like the pilot school, I, I did what they told me to do and yeah, <laughs> it ended up working. Um, so I, I, I do really well in that type of environment where there's a type of structure. I haven't really been able to figure out how to transfer it to um, some field where I have no conception of and, and no mentor or anything like that. And maybe it's possible. I'm, I'm sure it is. Uh, but part of it is just the fun of exploring things too, I guess, and, and picking things up that way. But I mean, when you showed up in Alaska, you were vegan, if I remember correctly. Maybe you still consider yourself, but like you had to, you 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 learned to hunt, yeah. you learned to trap, <laughs> you learned to do everything that is involved with like having a dead animal and then being able to eat it. So you've learned a ton of skills. Like your mom, like your mom said, you had no skills when you were nineteen that were appropriate for Alaska, and now you, you have the skills of a man living in Alaska. You have a garden, you raise animals, you hunt, all these things. You seem to have had a lot of free time. I got the perception that you had a lot of free time, at least in the beginning. And you also didn't drink much, at least, which is great. So, like, how much of you just having a lot of free time and it, like, having nothing else to do um, was an element in learning those skills? Um, or was it just, I mean, you seem like someone who's so excited and curious and interested in what you're doing. You have this conception of yourself that that's what's driving you. Yeah, I think I, the free time definitely plays a large component of it. Um, at least, you know, recently and and even, you know, back when I was working as a tour guide, anytime I have a long day, you know, eight hours, seven, even seven hours, six hours, whatever, or more, um, I feel like just like what, what probably the average person does, you know, too tired to do anything else and I don't want to do anything else. I'm content to just, just like surf the internet or read a book and call it a day and not really work on any skills. So yeah, I, I definitely think having a large chunk of free time um, helps with that. And then, yeah, just <laughs> there's so many failures, so many failures over the years and just doing things wrong <laughs> and learning and being just a complete idiot <laughs> uh, <laughs> just because of like not knowing, but you know, that's how you get better. And um, so I guess part of it was like being open to things and I guess still is being open to things and, and trying things and and being willing to to be wrong, which is very hard for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, yeah, and, and just like lots of practice. I, I found like direct practice with everything. Like you can read a book about hunting or dressing an animal, um, but you're not going to know anything until you go out and actually do it. Um, and I was in that regard in hunting, you know, there's like a, some things that are fortunate and in Alaska, generally meat that's confiscated from hunters by uh, the police, uh, state troopers who, you know, hunt illegally or, um, yeah, just break any kinds of laws or there's an animal that's hit in the road. It's confiscated and given to somebody in the community. And everybody else was successful hunters in the community. And so they all had freezers full of meat. And so I would often get, like, I got caribou and I would get moose and they'd just be full quarters. So it'd be an, a completely dressed out animal. Um, and then you just have to basically you know, butcher it out and get it to specific cuts. And so that was a great way to practice uh, in terms of that because 
you know, hunting, killing the animal, uh, and even just finding it is just really the beginning part of the process, but then getting the whole stuff later on. And, um, I've always found that to be the, the tricky part, but yeah, getting lucky with things like that. And, and then just having people willing to show me, I found that, you know, if you show an eager interest in something and you don't act like a punk and you show up reliably that people are, are willing to impart their knowledge on you, especially if it's something that, um, a lot of people aren't generally interested in. Mm. You, you mentioned failures. Um, I wanted to ask about, wanted to ask about your second experience in Alaska. I think that was the summer after your Knowles experience. You came back up yep. to Alaska. Um, what, what's the story with that? If you're, if yeah. you're okay to talk okay, about Okay, so, <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay, so um, after I, I did Knowles, I went back to school, and I, I kind of suffered from a culture shock, you know, spending so much time in the wilderness and then going back uh, first to Chicago area briefly and then before returning to school. It was just, there was so much stimulation, so many, so much asphalt, concrete, everything and it was kind of overwhelming and I just wanted to be back in the wilderness you know with the small group of people that I'd come to um, really enjoy being around and that obviously didn't happen and so as a result I, I kind of tried to find different outlets to fill that void and I started learning about you know all the different outdoor adventures that people went on. I didn't really know about any things like the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail before doing Knowles. And I started looking at things like that and then started learning that, you know, there are people who are like professional adventurers and just go around full time doing really big trips like Andrew Skirka, you know, doing all the long trails or coming up with their own trails and then people doing off trail stuff and people in Alaska like Roman Dial um, doing, you know, their own creative routes off trail. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's awesome. I want to do that. And um, so I wanted to go back to Alaska, and I didn't really have a plan to do anything there work-wise. Initially, I thought I might work at the Knowles, um, their Knowles branch, um, just working on, on campus for them there. But uh, I decided I wanted to do some type of adventure, and then I could be an adventurer and take videos and whatever and write write articles. And so in Alaska, the northernmost mountain range is the Brooks Range. It stretches the expanse of the state, 800 miles. It's the northernmost extent of the Rockies. It runs east to west, um, entirely in the Arctic. And there, at that time, in 2013, there were probably seven or eight people who had hiked the entire length of it, starting in Canada, hiking to the Chukchi Sea uh, in Kotzebue. In, in one go. And even now, there's probably only um, maybe a dozen people who have done it. It's it's It basically takes a couple months, and, you know, you're only crossing one road, the only road that goes through northern Alaska once. Um, it's very remote, <laughs> oh passing maybe one, one town in the whole time. Oh, my God. <laughs> so people will do that. They'll often, you know, fly from Fairbanks out to the start, and then they'll hike along and get food drops every eight or nine days. And that's expensive. You know, it costs 3000 to to go out to Canada and then, you know, 800 every food drop. I didn't have that type of money. So I, I was like, oh, I could start from the road and then do a loop around. <laughs> and then, yeah, I got carried away and I was like, oh, well, why would I just do it once? Why not do it twice? And so I came up with like a route where I'd go east to Canada, loop around, uh, cross the road again, then go all the way around the west side and then finish on the road. And so that was all swell. I got everything planned out. I got all my food packaged, um, everything set out, and I flew up to Fairbanks. And and how old are um, you when you do this? 21, I think. Um, or 20. I was 20 years old. And, I don't know, 21. Uh, anyways, 21 years old and fly up to Fairbanks. And <laughs> um, I read Your Money or Your Life and didn't and ERE and didn't have any skills. <laughs> so... Uh, the thing I did was, was be cheap <laughs> instead of smart. And so I, I got in the airport at 1 a.m. in Fairbanks, and um, I was going to hitchhike up to the Arctic, and I walked to the opposite side of town uh, and caught my first ride uh, sometime after 8 a.m. So I caught a couple of rides a little bit outside of town, and 
then um, eventually, you know, uh, the last guy, he, he, was, he wasn't going all the way. And the, the, basically the place I was trying to go to from Fairbanks was 250 miles up the road. Um, and Fairbanks is really the last town on the road. So you get some people living outside um, the city, but generally there's nobody really going on. So I started walking on the road. I, I had my thumb out and was trying to get rides and all these semi-trucks and uh, pickup trucks and everybody else was just passing me all day. And so I get out a bunch and I realize that eventually I'm not going to catch a ride. So I start walking back. Um, I think ended up walking like 30 miles or something total <laughs> during the day. And the same guy, the last guy who dropped me off, he ends up picking me <laughs> up on his way back from work <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> to go into Fairbanks. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even recognize him because I was so dehydrated <laughs> until I was like, we were already driving. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then, so then I'm like, okay, I got some sense and I bought a flight with the same, um, tourists that I would eventually, you know, guide going up to Coldfoot and they dropped me off there. And then I hitchhiked up from there to my starting point. Um, well, the guy who picked me up, he had friends in Wiseman and we stopped there and met, um, who the guy who was eventually my neighbor and taught me a lot of stuff. And so that's actually how I became familiar with that area. Um, but then we continued up another 50 miles or so, uh, to the starting point. They, they were going on their own trip and they dropped me off and I just realized, you know, I was way out of my element. Um, basically, you know, 50 miles from the nearest truck stop, then another, you know, 250 miles from the nearest town. And I was all by myself in these massive mountains. And I was, just, I was frankly just scared. Um, you know, I'd done the Knowles course. So I had all the, the skills to be able to camp, but none of that I was, I was ever by myself um, in that type of environment. And so I ended up camping um, just the one night and decided to turn around. Uh, I hitched a ride back with the trucker the next morning and went all the way back to Fairbanks and ended up um, flying out. So, yeah, it was kind of a combination of, like, extreme arrogance of a 21-year-old, uh, somebody <laughs> at, like, the peak of Mount Stupid uh, who has a little bit of skill and thinks that they're suddenly an expert. Um, and then, yeah. Ar arrogance and ego mainly but yeah that, that was kind of dejecting <laughs> um well you certainly uh, uh what's the word like um you, you, you've made up for that since then it, it makes me think of uh like the relationship between fear and courage and I, I feel like that's those are two sensations that you've got a lot of experience with because like I mean, even for that story that you just said, like, you need a lot of courage just to even get to the mountains in the first place. Share some arrogance and whatever, right. but what 21-year-old doesn't? Um, but then you're looking at those mountains, and you're 250 miles away from a town, and you've got the fear. And there, there's a relationship between those two things, and navigating the tension between them can be really, really interesting. And, I, I mean, I, I think lots of people would have that experience that you had and then like never go to Alaska again. <laughs> you know, they'd right. be an accountant right now. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but like, that's not really what you wanted. Right. And so like, I'm sure that was just, God, just like getting kicked and facing the mud. Like, I'm just trying to imagine how that felt, but you know, you eventually, I mean, you know, the next year you came back and here you are today. Right. Right. So, so there's a courage to like, just keep trying. Because at some point, I think you, there's a fear of like, well, I tried it once. That should have been my warning. You know, I'm going back to the lower 48. I'm not coming back kind of thing. But that's not what you did. You have right. the courage to like, all right, I just got kicked in the face when I'm coming back. Right. Yeah. I guess, you know, that, that first experience with Knowles, it, it really was one of the best times of my life, if not the best time of my life. It was just so pure. And, you know, I had such a sense of an internal peace that, I, I knew what was possible. I, I knew what was there and that maybe, you know, the way I was going about it, whether that was on my own, wasn't exactly the way to do it. And I still kind of struggle with that to a little bit. You know, you and I, have, we've talked about it um, other times in, in the sense of going out. And I think for you, and, and there's people in Alaska too, um, growing up where people are the exception rather than the norm, you're more comfortable um, by yourself in, in wilderness environments, 
Whereas even though I, I'm generally comfortable, I'm not, part, I don't know what, I guess I'm scared of uh, going into these environments and it's not Grizzly necessarily bears. the most, yeah, definitely afraid of bears. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, that is one thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess it's the bears. <laughs> but there is an element, you know, uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. There's always the bears. <laughs> I may have grown up and I might have a, I might be more comfortable with the lack of other people, but you know, I grew up in a place where we have black bears. We don't have brown bears. Um, I don't have the courage right. to go sleep in a tent in Alaska. Uh, right. I mean, I know how to sleep in a tent in California. I would go with you and sleep in a tent in Alaska because I trust you, but I'm not going by myself or with, with someone else at my skill level and knowledge level, you know, to right. Alaska. <laughs> that scares the hell out of me. <laughs> um, right. I feel like your story is such a great, there's such a great element of like the internal journey and the external journey. Like you have all of these external stories, like you're in Alaska, there's the elements, there's fear, there's courage, all these things you have to deal with. And then there's also um, this other journey. Part, part of the thing that really interests me is like, um, you, you, you're trying to do something really different. You're trying to live a lifestyle that not many people are living. Um, and that's something that's really interesting to me. That's like one of the reasons I have this podcast. I'm, I'm interested in alternative lifestyles, people doing what they want to do, breaking their paradigm, coming up with their own paradigm. And no matter what that is, that can take, that involves fear and courage, I think, to do something that's not expected, to do something that other people are, are will question you, they don't understand why you're doing it. What's so interesting about you is that you're doing this in really obvious way in an environment that's that's harsh and there's lots of opportunities f for testing yourself kind of taking a 90 you were you're you signed up for a, a woodworking course yeah yeah so um i guess i was talking with our mutual friend cody and uh we were talking about um basically woodworking in general and i think i was talking with him about there was a school in california and Oh, it's nine months, and I don't really want to do woodworking for nine months. But but doing a school and having some type of mentor would be would be cool. And he he suggested this. Uh, he mentioned this town in Port Townsend, Washington, or the school in Port Townsend, Washington, um, Port Townsend School of Woodworking. And there they have three month intensive courses, and basically uh, designed to take somebody from a novice level um, with some skills to be able to work in uh, a shop somewhere or open up their own shop. Uh, making furniture or, or doing woodworking and so i'm i'm taking one of their courses starting in january uh, of 2023 and it is foundations of woodworking so it's working exclusively with hand tools exploring traditional jo joinery um, all project based um, working with dovetails and mortise and tenon um, th things like that and yeah the main desire i guess i've, I've been interested in woodworking kind of since both reading Pernicky and then watching um, Jacob, Jacob Lundfisker of Earlier Time and Extreme, uh, work through it himself and kind of taking an interest in doing that. Um, and I don't know, I think I think woodworking, um, not only is it a marketable skill in that you could do something like sell furniture or sell a cabinet or something like that, um, but you can use it for, you know, your own purposes. And generally, I... I guess part of this journey, it's been trying to be able to have control over all the aspects of my life, whether that's food or shelter or the things within it, and being able to understand it on a higher level. Um, and I've, I've tried to do that. I've been able to do that on my own for a lot of things, but with woodworking, um, I've had a hard time getting started. And that could just be, you know, the result of my procrastination, but I do feel like having a mentor and people to give feedback in a shorter time frame uh, ends up could end up being very valuable. So let me check it out and hope it goes well. Nice. Yeah, I'm going to follow along with interest. Um, I've had a kind of similar, I've had an interest in woodworking for a long time, but I, well, for me, I never had the time. I never made the time. Um, but right. kind of now that I'm stable, I'm looking to do something about that. Um, a lot of what you do in your story, it could seem to make sense in the context of someone who goes to Alaska and wants to live off the land, uh, very self-reliantly, right? Learn all these skills. 
Um, but that's also kind of one of the core tenets of ERE, which is the ERE forms how we know each other, right? And so I'm, I'm wondering right. <clears throat> how strategic has your life been, has the last decade of your life been versus how has it been identity-based? Because you, you mentioned this uh, self-conception of yourself that you had, which almost got you in trouble a couple of times. But this idea of yourself, which I'm gathering was largely due to the, you know, the Prenicky books and this idea of like being this Alaskan person. I'm a person who to like, I err on the side of being overly strategic. I think things through and then every once in a while I'll remember to actually do something about the strategy I came up with. And so I'm wondering like, what's that balance like for you? Do you, do you think really long term? Do you think strategically or do you just, or are you just like, well, this is the version of myself I want to be. The version of myself is a person who learns woodworking, is a person who hunts, is a person who builds his own cabin, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, I, I think identity based is a large part of it. There's, there's definitely some strategic elements, like with things I want to do with my household. Um, you know, planning with the garden, or we've got some fruit and nut trees, and figuring out how those go. And, um, but otherwise, you know. A lot of it just just arises. It's emergent, you know. Um, like the forestry job just happened because I became friends with the guy who was the director of it, and ended up applying. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm I'm on a, a trip now. I'm on a, a two month road trip prior to the woodworking course, which you know I arose from just talking with a friend. Uh, but we're on a two month wood, uh, trip through the Southwest, uh, mainly Utah, basically just from reading a book. <laughs> Uh, and deciding <laughs> that that might be fun. <laughs> so um, I guess some of it might be spur of the moment. There are there are strategic elements there. Um, I, but yeah, yeah, I guess I, it's probably more of a blend of the two rather than strongly dominant one or the other. Yeah. Well, it seems like if you want to have a life that's extremely... Uh, self-reliance skills based grow your own food all this other stuff one simple trick you can do to get that in your life is move to alaska and figure it out which is kind of like kind of what you did right you know but no it's, it's really that whole, like though. <laughs> no well i mean it, it allows you to do that because it's like the identity base but alaska is like the worst place to, to grow anything and then to even yeah. hunt for animals the density is terrible and all that but but yeah you know <laughs> There, there is a subset of people there mm. and being able to learn that. Um, but yes, doing the things is more difficult there. Yeah, if you want to go live off the land, you should head towards the equator, not away from it. Um, right. But I guess it's, yeah, no, that's a good point. It's, it's like the identity. Like, I'm sure there's a lot of people in Alaska who don't know how to kill a bear with their bare hands, but the idea is that the people do. <laughs> and so... Yeah, particularly you go seek those people out and then that that's like that's the whole uh you're the average of the five people you know kind of idea right like exactly yep yeah is there anything that you would do differently like like Prinicky had you know 20 year olds writing him for advice if a 20 year old wrote you for advice and said like hey i'm really inspired do you have any advice for me is there anything in particular you you you'd tell them or an, a younger version of yourself yeah <laughs> I don't know. I was just so dead set on going north that I'm not sure if there was anything that would dissuade me. Uh, but, <laughs> and you know, you have to, it, it's hard to go back because you have to learn these things or go through them really to learn them. But like, it, it definitely would have been easier with another person if, if I had a girlfriend or, or a wife, something like that. Um, because as you can imagine in a, a town of 11 people, there's not much dating going on. And then, yeah, I mean, getting skills elsewhere is going to be a lot easier um, than getting them in a place where you can't get any resources really and have a small group of people to basically develop. Um, and then I've, I have kind of come around to the idea, like Prenicky's idea that there is, there is a lot to see in the world and, you know, there's not that many people who live in remote Alaska or, or anything like that in that, that land is not really going to change very much in the foreseeable future the way i see it or at least that lifestyle it it it's going to be possible so it's it's not really something at risk of of going away so yeah exploring different aspects of the world um is nice but of course then you might get in you know like the luxury trap or whatever and get stuck in the cities but i i don't imagine anybody listening to your podcast is is on that on that route <laughs> 
Uh, kind of going back to the topic of money, you had a, an interesting financial project this year, the PFD year. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So it was kind of a self, self-created self idea. Uh, well, not really, actually. I, I kind of stole it from, uh, there was another member on the ERE forums called Riparian. She lives or li- she grew up in Alaska and lived there for a long time. I'm not sure if she still lives there or not. But um, she had the idea that she always wanted to live on the Alaska PFD. The Alaska PFD is the permanent fund dividend, which is a dividend um, paid out to every Alaskan resident each year as a result of investments that come from um, royalties off the oil money uh, or royalties off um, the oil revenue generated by the oil companies within the state. And so, yeah, I guess traditionally the, the, dividend was calculated by the previous five year, the average of the previous five year returns. And it kind of got changed because the Alaska economy has kind of been a mess for the past decade. But I calculated it basically to come out to something like $3,800. That would be the historic amount for this year. And, you know, there's people who do buy nothing years. Um, and I, I thought that was, that was cool, but I figured I could probably game it. And I just needed like a more concrete number to actually make it legitimate. And so I decided that outside of healthcare costs, um, I would try to get $3,800 for all my expenses. Um, with the caveat, I guess that I have a paid off house, um, but property tax, all that included and, um, in the annual expenses. So anyways, uh, yeah, I'm still in the process of it. I have passed $3,800. I think I passed it in, uh, towards the end of September. Um, now I'm at something like, 5,100, um, I think for the year and probably end up, you know, another four, 500 higher. Um, and I think it was generally useful, mainly in the fact that I did decrease my expenses basically by half of what I spent last year. And I'm not sure I would have done that otherwise. And then also useful in the sense that it seems like transportation basically was, um, and meaning having a car and, and going around in that was basically how I missed my goal each month and how I'm missing my goal overall um, could basically determine by whether or not I buy, you know, a certain amount of gas each month or not. And so, yeah, I guess that's the one thing I've, I've always kind of struggled with. Um, and, you know, I'm curious watching you because you're kind of em- embarking on this now. And it's, it's something that I find really interesting and admirable and, and want to take on. But I guess I end up chickening out in that, you you know, you gave up your car and you're, you're like walking to town or taking the bus or whatever. And now you got a bike, um, but making it work in a really rural environment. Um, and yeah, there's, there's just not that many people who do that. And so like, like if I bail out and take the car, you know, to go 10 miles to the store, it's like... <laughs> everybody, you know, nobody's going to think that's, that's bad of me. It's like, oh yeah, that, you went 10 miles, whatever. It's like, oh, it's like, but come on. It's like, I, I, I go bike, I do long bike pack, I bike trips, you know, I've hiked for, um, you know, 50 plus miles in a day. Why can't I hike 10 miles to the store? Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear uh, how that's going for you. And if, if you feel like it's changed your mentality with regard to, to travel. Well, well, one thing I will say is that, uh, you know, the, co- the absolute coldest it has ever gotten here is like seven degrees Fahrenheit. So like, <laughs> you know, like in your winter, that's like a, almost a warm day. I, I don't know. So th- there is that, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean like, yeah, where I live there, it's, it's, it's here. There's a couple more houses a mile down the road and then it's desert for the next 20 miles. There's a town, another 10 miles. There's a bigger town. So there's, there's, there's basically nothing for about 30 miles um and um i mean so far it's been going great uh i haven't felt deprived or neglected or anything like that um i'm still getting my system up and running um i don't have the bike yet i'm going to be getting it soon which is going to be a game changer yeah i I walked to town one time 24 24 miles because i started down the road a little bit 
and it took me a month for my feet to heal. <laughs> I, I didn't have the right shoes. Like the longest, the longest I had walked previously was just a couple of miles. Uh, so it was, it was, the first twelve miles were easy, but then, uh, then it started to hurt in the last four hour, uh, four miles were just a complete suffer fest. I was like hobbling the whole way. Um, <clears throat> So that was uh, good from a, I did a hard thing this year perspective, but uh, that's that's not uh, that's not very repeatable. So I need to um, get my uh, get my systems up a little bit better than that. But there's a bus that goes three days a week um, that I can walk three miles to the pass and catch, um, go in get food, you know, fill up my pack with groceries, come back. It it's half the cost of the gas it would take to get into town. And yeah, like you said, like the transportation cost, you know, before I sold my truck, the transportation cost was huge. The, the fixing it, maintenance, oil, gas, right. registration, insurance, all that stuff. It's a lot. Um, right. And there's also always the risk of like, oh, I might get in an accident or, you know, something right. serious might break. Like I had, yeah, I had that truck for four years. And I had at least three things go out where I had to drop at least a grand on it. Um, and right. that could happen at any time, you know, it had a quarter million miles by the time I got rid of it. So I honestly, like, I feel more free not having a car living 30 miles from anywhere than I did having a car. Um, right. So, yeah, so, so far so good. I've, I've got some tweaks to improve the system, but yeah, I, I, I feel I would feel uh, <clears throat> almost criminal encouraging you to do the same in Alaska as someone who's living <laughs> in California. Like, oh, yeah. I'm doing it in California. It's easy. Go for it, man. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I mean, the winter is easier in a sense that, you know, the summer, everything's just a bog and there's swamps everywhere. So you can only mm. really stick to the roads. Whereas the winter, there's trails everywhere and it basically cuts my distance in half to go to town. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. But I I don't know. Yeah. It, it's a tough one, especially with the kid now. I kind of feel like, uh, you know, she's she's outside and she'll be tough and all that. But. <laughs> there's like a part of me that's like, oh yeah, is it really smart to take your kid to the grocery store if it's like negative ten out, <laughs> and even if you like bundle it up with skins or whatever, it's like, <laughs> am I gonna be that guy? I might be that guy. <laughs> you might be that guy. Well, it's interesting to think about like what you know what what was acceptable behavior. I mean, you know, before cars, that's just what everyone did. If you wanted to get somewhere, you brought your kid with you, and it was negative whatever it was. Um, right. I mean, in like, Alaska. People lived outside. They, they were yeah. living outside and traveling by dog team, you know, in colder places than I live now. So it's like, yeah, I guess who's who's uh, the smart ones? I don't know. Yeah. Well, Unless I think it, it comes down you know, to skills, right? Like if, if I were to, to, to take a small child and like – if someone gave me like a dog sled team and a small child, like that's a crime waiting to happen right there. But if someone who knows what they're doing, <laughs> who has appropriate skills, it's like – no, actually, that kid's probably safer with that person with those skills in that setup than anyone in a car, you know, just because cars right. go fast and they're dangerous or whatever. So, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's a balance. But there's always going to be that perception. Right. O on that note, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do some weird things with my lifestyle. You're living it up there. Um, and I'm really appreciative of the fact that you have a family, you have a wife and a kid, because sometimes people will say to me, like, oh, well, of course, you, it's easy for you, Tyler. You're single. You have no kids. You have no dependents, whatever. I can say, like, well, yeah, but there's my buddy Jack up in Alaska. He's got a family, and he's living, like, a weird, crazy, awesome life on his own terms, and he's not letting that stop him. Does having a family, has that changed how you think about your life? Did you always want a family? Like, you know, how do you, how do you think about that in terms of uh, your lifestyle and design of it and everything? Yeah, I, I think at least... Over the past few years, I probably since coming to Alaska, I, I realized that I wanted a family, at least at least somebody to be with, and um, yeah, it, it was really hard for a while because I wasn't I wasn't dating anybody, and generally Alaska, it's really poor dating market. The it's it's not quite sixty to forty, but you know it's it's something pretty close for the male to female ratio. <laughs> for the for the females, they say the the saying goes, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> <laughs> just because you, <get, laughs> you get all kinds of people but um yeah i mean when i met alana um she was working forestry and, and that's how we met um uh, it really worked out because she's somebody who shares similar values she was working on trail crews for eight years throughout the southwest um 
prior to living in Alaska. So she was living outside, um, basically continuously in a tent and, um, yeah, had, had no qualms about doing any of the things that I was doing and, and wanted to continue that, um, and had that interest. So having somebody who share the, shares those values has actually enabled, enabled me to do more, I think, in the sense that, um, like those trips and even like further out hunting stuff that I wanted to do, but might've been too scared to do by myself, having somebody who wanted to go with me and encourage me, um, was very helpful and yeah, just more enjoyable for myself. And then having the kid, um, she was just born in September. So she's, we're only like seven weeks in. Uh, so it's really early yet, but you know, we're in, we're in the Southwest. We're, we're in the San Rafael as well now and camping out. And, um, it's, you know, people did this for so long and it, kids really don't change that much. And it, we've been inspired by some of our friends who've taken their kids on long bicycle trips across, um, the U S and other places. And then there's people in Alaska who they'll take their kids on uh, multi-month pack rafting and hiking trips, um, on like the Alaska coast going like 800 miles. It's just, everything just, it's, it's just a little slower. You know, I'm not, it's not like doing the adventure races where it's go, go, go. You know, you have to stop every couple hours and baby has to feed or you have to change a diaper or whatever. But otherwise the baby is not, (laughs) she's not spending money. We're the ones who are spending money. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The baby is not deciding that she wants, you know, to play Roblox or watch some video on YouTube. (laughs) We're we're not, we're not giving her that option um, at least for quite a few years. Um, And so, yeah, well, we're, we're, we're open to seeing how things work out and adapting if need be, but for the moment, um, you know, it hasn't, hasn't really changed too much. I imagine it'll, it'll change as, as she gets older and we'll have to evolve and change, but you know, the type of lifestyle we want to live, um, and I think, you know, you and, and, and other people listening to this or people on the Erie forums and similar mindset, it, it's generally a pretty simple lifestyle and not consumerist for the adults. And so, with kids, you know, the kids in all families really live the same as adults. It's, it's not really any different. And so basically the only, yeah, I mean, I could be just speaking out of ignorance out of being a a new parent or whatever, (laughs) come back to bite me in the ass later on, but, um, people all all, all across the world. 13 years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's good so far, and, and we're just trying to find follow kind of the model of um, basically that not everything is necessary. You don't need to follow the consumerist model, whether you're an adult or and the same thing applies to kids. People survive for millions of years without living in, in civilization, and even in civilization, living on less, and people still do it all across the world today, probably the vast majority of people. So, um, yeah, so it, it it's kind of a process, but that's where we're at now. Cool. That's, yeah, that's, I don't know, I just get shivers thinking about that. It's it's really inspiring to see what you're doing and, and that you're doing it with family. Yeah. Your, uh, your wife gave a, a, a workshop at your property a while back. A year back, I forget. Could you, yep. what, what was that workshop she did? Yeah, so she is very skilled um, with chainsaws. Uh, we have three chainsaws at our house. They are all hers. <laughs> at one point, we had five. I told her we had to knock it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, she loves chainsaws, loves cutting down trees, and is very skilled at doing so. She got a bunch of certifications doing um, the working with the trail work and using them there. And so she's wanted to do that for a while and actually wanted to work um, fire uh, for wildland fire for a while, but um, that never ended up working out. But anyways, um, she wanted to, to be able to work on it and pass it on. And so she started uh, a workshop teaching other women in the area uh, basically how to use a chainsaw and how to fell trees and eventually buck them into firewood. It was a two day course. Um, and she had a great turnout. She did, I think just about two sessions and, uh, had like 10 women come. Um, and then, uh, yeah, she'd like to keep doing it. Um, you know, made a, a decent amount of money from it and, um, would like to keep doing it going forward. Um, she got, pre- she was pregnant this past year, obviously. So, uh, she didn't want to <laughs> risk using a chainsaw and having anything happen. But, um, yeah, that's, that's like, I guess part of our thing going forward and, and she's not working now. Um, so I'm covering the expenses mainly for the both of us and that going forward, we want to just kind of be able to do things that we want to do, um, 
on her own terms and whether that's I think I mentioned earlier, you know, taking a job working for someone else, like she might want to do trail building or something else, but probably definitely doing um, some more workshop workshops and things like that. Um, but yeah, she is she is definitely uh, a very handy lady, and uh, glad to marry her for that as well as plenty of other reasons. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm interested in uh, in your your food system. Um, that food is something I've been focused on recently. Um, in terms of uh, expenses and costs, but also in terms of, uh, you know, my values and uh, things of that nature. You know, I, I have this sort of ideal way I'd like to eat, where I'd, my, I'd like my food to come from. Um, it's a long process for me. Um, I've, I know only a little bit about kind of your food system. I know that you figured out how to eat for not very much. And obviously, you know, there's this, the, the game that you process and things like that. You have a garden. And um, at least in 2012, you were vegan. So I'm interested in what what's your food system like? Yeah, it's it's kind of been evolving and and gotten more complex over the years. I started out, I guess, in while during in, um, while I was in college, I I became vegan, um, and that experience basically taught me how to cook. I didn't really know how to cook prior to that, and I suddenly became vegan, and you know I didn't. Um, mainly for health reasons, um, and and I didn't know what to eat, essentially. So I had a bunch of different recipe books, and I would just make all kinds of different things. And that taught me how to cook, so that was a great experience for that. Uh, but then, you know, I eventually moved to Alaska and to the Arctic, and like I said, 250 miles from the nearest grocery store. And Alaska, as it is, you know, 99% of the food is imported from outside the state. So any produce or anything we get is not fresh. <laughs> it does not tastes like what it does when when you just you know get it out of soil or get it anywhere else um so going into that winter of my first winter in alaska um i was still able to be vegan but then i started transitioning away from it um just i guess basically from a both the sanity and a health perspective i didn't really think it was i could eat rice and beans but i didn't really think it was the healthy, healthiest thing to do just to exclusively eat rice and beans and i also started receiving like small bits of, of meat from some of the local people in the area, just as like a, a gift piece of caribou or moose or something like that. And, you know, I had no, no qualms really about eating, eating wild game. So, um, I think at first I, I would, I introduced eggs and fish into my routine and then I started fishing, um, for myself, uh, and adding that and then hunting came on and that is still a process that that's taking the, the longest just because, you know, there's so much involved and, um, it's 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 one of the hardest things to learn but um or that i've learned and but that that slowly came on and then um i started gardening while i was in the arctic and then eventually in fairbanks you know i have we have a garden and uh we have planted some nut trees and and some apple trees and plums and other fruit trees and um in 2020 we shared we, we did some, we had some pigs with, um, some of our friends. We had three pigs total. Two of those were ours. And then one was, was our friend, uh, basically on the arrangement goes. And so we basically, um, were responsible for feeding them throughout the summer. And we had heard from somebody else in the area that you could get food, um, from the food bank that they were discarded. Basically the food bank gets so much food, they can only store so much. So after they give it to people, they have some that they'll give to farmers in the area. And, so we started showing up and there was just a ridiculous amount of food. We watched people, other uh, people who were farmers, they would, they would show up with like 16 foot trailers and fill them with boxes and boxes of food just from all the restaurants and uh, grocery stores in the area who donated. And so we started feeding our pigs that and we started noticing that a lot of the food was good. Uh, that, you know, the bread wasn't moldy and it was like high quality bread from a bakery the day before. Or there was like good bananas or avocados. Um, or there was like, there was even like frozen uh, salmon from, from Alaska. And so we started high grading some of the, the good stuff. And that really helped to decrease the cost. And uh, the, the pigs got a really good meal, uh, really fat. Um, and really, they remained really healthy off of that. Uh, ended up getting something like 196 pounds of meat just for our share alone, coming out to like $2.50 a pound, uh, with most of that coming from just the initial purchasing process, or purchasing, purchasing costs of the piglets. But, um, so yeah, it's been, we've kind of tried everything. Um, 
And I see food, um, I think, probably pretty similar to you in that I, I am concerned about the health aspects and I want to know where the food's coming from. I want high quality sources. And I believe in, you know, a lot of the ways getting it myself is, pro you know, I, I know where it's coming from and I, and I think it's generally healthy that way. Uh, it's also often cost efficient. Um, and then just from like a resiliency, resiliency standpoint, I don't really, I, I become increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of relying on going to the supermarket uh, to get food um, and using that as the sole source. And, you know, there's, I don't remember the exact days, maybe you can correct me if you know, but there's something like three days of food supply at any one time in the, in the global supply system. There's, it's something like ridiculously small. Whatever the number so is, like it's any, kind of terrifying, of, yeah. Right. It's like, I don't want to, I don't want to have to be, you know, subject myself or my family, um, to just what's on the grocery, se grocery shelves due to some panic or, or whatever else. So yeah, even more so than I think having, having like assets, uh, in terms of financial assets, things like having food in the freezer or having a garden that's productive are really, um, empowering, I guess is the word. Uh, basically, you know, you feel the wealth when you have, you know, a freezer full of salmon, caribou, and, you know, produce you put up in the winter, and then the other stuff too, like woodshed full of wood, and, but it's, it's like natural wealth rather than financial. But I have been, uh, I know you've been exploring food, and then you had the recent blog post talking about the dollars per calorie, and oh, yeah. I really like that, um, because for me, that, that kind of came down to isolating you know i think what, what you had it was 400 dollars 400 calories per dollar comes out to like 200 dollars a month and 800 800 calories per dollar comes out to 100 dollars and especially at the 800 calories per dollar mark it comes out to you know just bulk goods things that it's like impractical to grow yourself like you're not going to grow a field of wheat and grind all the grain <laughs> or even yeah. something like olive oil or butter and it kind of reminds me of like the old school um, trappers in Alaska and the miners. They'd have like a grub steak, you know, a list of like 50 pounds of nails, a sack of flour, uh, 20 pounds <laughs> of sugar go out. And then they'd hunt for, you know, or grow a garden for their, their supplements. So it's yeah. like you get your staples <laughs> from from your your local uh, roadhouse or your supermarket. And then you go out and you're able to supplement the rest with, with whatever means you have. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that might be an, an interesting approach to it. Um, and and I'll, you were talking about how little, um, how quickly the shelves would empty if the supplies stopped at the grocery store, and how it feels really empowering, and secure to have a freezer full of food, right? Yeah, like I've you know, just behind me right now, I've got you know, a, a pile of five gallon buckets full of food. You know, my my pantry's pretty deep. I've only just started, so it's an immature system, but it feels nice knowing that I could go a ways without having to go to the grocery store if I really had to, you know? Um, like I said, it's right. immature, so I've got a lot to, to learn and a lot to kind of flesh out. I don't have enough nutrients, for example, in my in my food buffer at the moment, but I wouldn't starve to death. <laughs> right, and that's right. Like, You'd oh, survive cool. and be able to I almost starved to death. That feels else. nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll right. Start drinking the Mormon tea or whatever we got around here, you know? Um, <laughs> Do you, do you know about what your your monthly food costs is? I know I know it, it varies a lot, but do you have like a, a number? Yeah, it's, it's I think over this year it's something like one hundred fifteen dollars and one hundred fifteen dollars a month. So not as low as you know I, I think other people on the ERE forum or, or elsewhere, but um, part of that is incorporating you know gas expenses, going out fishing or something like that, and associated permits um, to get the food. Um, it could it could probably be lower. Um, I'm not sure how much, but I, I think I could probably get it to I could probably get it around a hundred dollars or, or slightly lower. Um, food is a little bit more expensive in Alaska, but um, yeah, I mean I'm not I, I don't buy meat um, and so I don't buy meat or fish. and so basically the only things I'm buying are either staples or prior to having the garden um, veggies. Um, so it it's it really doesn't end up being that much i guess the the bulk expenses so far um nuts and oils oils and fats yeah. 
you're kind of famous for being in exceptionally good shape. And this is a selfish question because I used to be in really, uh, I was obsessed with uh, lifting weights for a long time, but I haven't been for a really long time. And so I'm not as in as good a shape as I'd like to be. Uh, and I just like the be idea of being really fit. Um, but you seem to have nailed that up there. What do you, how do you approach fitness and training and, and stuff like that? Yeah, I guess I, I started out getting into it um, with kind of the DVD workouts, doing things like P90X and Insanity, and then it kind of evolved from there. Um, that was the bulk of what I did for quite a while. And then when I was in the Arctic, you know, I had so much free time when I was living by myself. Um, and I was, as I was getting lonely, I was kind of exploring things to do. And one thing that I thought I might want to do is to join special operations in the military. And basically to get to that point, you know, I started working out um, a lot and following some of the guides that they had. And that really was the game changer. That was basically just CrossFit with a ton of more uh, cardio and endurance stuff. And so I started, you know, lifting real weights and uh, and doing a lot of pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, and, and uh, to, you know, running and, and cardio and all that. And, and that really seemed to make the biggest difference. Um, I don't do that stuff as much anymore. I did it, uh, I guess, a little bit going to Fairbanks, but then I, I started getting into kettlebells. Um, and particularly uh, one guy, Keith Weber, this Canadian, he's got some um, DVD programs called Extreme Kettlebell Cardio, I think it's called, or Extreme Cardio Kettlebell. Um, but either way, uh, yeah, he's basically making some programs out of that and um that mixed with you know i just i just try to do a bunch of stuff uh and and have it readily available like there's we don't live in a big house as it is our house is like 320 square feet um but you know i have we have kettle we have multiple kettlebells um and they're pretty easy access there's a pull-up bar above my desk with rings and um generally making it easy to access so like the default to do some type of exercise rather than not um, and then, you know, just the lifestyle <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure it's going to be the same with you, you know, walking, <laughs> walking 20 miles or however you walk, far you walk to the bus, uh, you know, eventually that just becomes uh, a daily thing or not a daily thing, but, a <laughs> like unremarkable thing, I guess. Um, in, in the sense that you, you've worked, worked up to that or in, and even the sense that, you know, you, your body just adapts and then you're able to do things that are, um, things that are extreme to other people seem normal for you like hiking up a mountain not getting out of breath or um yeah riding riding your bike you know 20 miles or whatever yeah it's another fitness is another thing that's empowering and you know there's just going back to health there's there's like a few things you have direct control over and and some of them are so simple whether it's controlling how much you sleep controlling to you know to what extent you can uh the foods you're able to eat but then exercise you know anybody can exercise you don't need that much space whether it's body weights or whatever and there's such a large impact on your health um and <laughs> speaking you know people are mindful about financials it's easier to to treat or to prevent prevention is eat simpler than the cure or something like that cheaper than the cure yeah. but <laughs> yeah 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 i was just because i've been helping a neighbor out uh, was just handy, handyman kind of work around the around his place, and it's uh, between it's like a mile and a half walk there, through this beautiful mountain pass. You know, I'm like I want to be walking that much in my life anyway, so it's like great, I'll just walk there. Right. And then, you know, in the first few months I was like, great, I'm walking. I'm getting my I'm getting some exercise in, but it's only a mile and a half there, a mile and a half back. Uh, so yesterday I was like, oh, I should be carrying a pack. I can ruck to his house. That's probably a good idea. Okay, cool. So the next time I go, you know, I'm going to incorporate that in. It's like I'm working out and I'm commuting and I'm oh, that's great. You know, working and enjoying time with my neighbor and stuff. So it's like I like working everything in. Right, yeah, multi-pronged um, approach. I love it. Yeah, stack the functions. Um, <laughs> is there anything else that you want to want to want to talk about? Want to share? Uh, no, I think we covered it. Um, yeah, really grateful for you having me on. Um, I've, I've always enjoyed reading your insights. Anybody who's not reading Tyler's blog should be checking it out. He's got tons of great things he's exploring and, and thinking about. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Tyler. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, and, and likewise, uh, everyone who's listening to this, 
<laughs> read all 44 pages of uh, <laughs> of your your journal. Which I'll link the show notes. You've got a blog, um, which is amazing. It's just, like the photography that you've done is just incredible. So I'm gonna link link to all of your stuff so that people can go check that oh, out. Thank you. So um, that's gonna be amazing. So. Jack, thank you so much for taking some time and having this conversation with me. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person at some point <laughs> soon. Yeah, 2023. We're doing yeah, it. We'll make it happen. Awesome. All right, take care. Have a good night, Jack. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Tyler. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. By the way, if you aren't subscribed to my newsletter, you probably should be. It complements this podcast quite a bit, but it doesn't overlap it. Go to tylerjdisney.com, scroll to the bottom of any page, and you'll find a little box to put your email in. Thanks.